But yeah, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about chapter number nine, layers from R4DS. I do want to say that we did have a little bit of a change. Someone had a scheduling conflict, so I had to kind of pick this up. I will mention, so please have a little bit of grace with me as I go through some of these notes. And um, I didn't have as much time uh, with that kind of scheduling change to prepare these as well as I would have liked. Um, but it's still good to kind of go through the material. I will highlight a couple things that aren't in these shared notes that I would have added um, if I did have that kind of time to kind of better prepare. Um, but I will kind of lean on the group to ask any further questions that they might have or add anything that I might get wrong with the material. So with that, I do want to start by saying um, we're going to start talking about layers. And really where we want to go today is we're going to talk about the grammar of graphics. And we're going to talk about how the grammar of graphics are translated into code, specifically using ggplot2. And so where we are going to go today is we want to talk about aesthetics and geometries, how we use those to build plots, talk about fastening and splitting plots into subsets. We're also going to talk about how to understand um, how genomes are used to calculate and represent our data uh, in a plot. We're also going to talk about making position adjustments when genomes might otherwise overlap. So talk about what do we do in cases where there's so much overlap in our data and so much overlap in our plots, what are some of the strategies we can use to address that? And then also we're going to talk about um, how, to coord how coordinate systems play within ggplot and how we can manipulate the coordinate systems to get a different representation of our data. And so that's where I want to go today. I do also want to mention that the exercises, I probably won't cover very many exercises today, mainly because there's a lot of them. And two, I just didn't have time to kind of look at them. But if there is one that someone wants to kind of dive into as we go through this, please let me know. But I do want to mention that the exercises in this chapter are really, really good, and they give you a good opportunity to better understand how to use ggplot2 to apply the grammar of graphics. So I've been saying this thing called the grammar of graphics, and um, there is an actual paper, an academic paper that is out there that was actually written by Hadley that kind of expands on this idea a little bit and talks about how this gets applied in ggplot2. I highly suggest everybody read this. Um, I know it's 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 academic writing, so it's um, it is dense in some areas, but it does give you the theoretical underpinning behind the grammar of graphics, and it really kind of describes how certain things are applied in ggplot2. And so, if you get a chance, and it's linked in the book, and I'm sharing it here, so you kind of know what it looks like. If you have the opportunity, I highly suggest reading it. Um, I've probably read it a few times now, and it really gives you a good understanding of how the theory of the grammar of graphics gets applied to creating plots. And so it gets referenced in the book, and I wanted to highlight this quick as like, hey, this there's theoretical underpinnings here that ggplot2 is following. And it's great to kind of see that it's formalized in this specific paper, in the specific, writ, uh, the specific article by Hadley. So um, let's see. So the first thing that we get talked about is we just kind of get an introduction. And these are the different elements that are we have we're going to talk about when it comes to talking about layers and applying these layers in ggplot2. And these elements are going to be data, aesthetics, geometries, facets, statistics, coordinates, and themes. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about themes. There's going to be a specific section in the book that's going to talk about how we apply or, or manipulate different theme elements. But we are going to spend a significant amount of time talking about these other six elements, data, aesthetics, geometry, facets, and statistics. I'm not going to read the definition to you. I don't think that's worth our time because we'll talk about each one of these in turn. But mainly I wanted to highlight these as these kind of like the main kind of concepts that we need to understand to do ggplot2 or use ggplot2 excuse me um i think Good. somebody is yes. i think somebody's off of mute so if you nope okay perfect thank you um so the first thing that i wanted to kind of cover is and i think this was discussed in the book is what does this grammar of graphics look like in terms of kind of the design pattern of ggplot2? 
And I really like this. And I wish this was probably talked about at the top of the chapter. So I wanted to introduce this like right at the first part of it. And really, I think this does a good representation of where those different elements of the grammar of graphics gets applied within ggplot2 code. Now, this isn't everything. Like your ggplot2 code is going to get a lot longer. Your visualization code to create plots is definitely going to be um, have many different elements. But basically, these are the locations of where you're going to be manipulating code to create the plots that you want to create. And what's really interesting is if you know these basic concepts, the book basically says you can create hundreds of thousands of graphics, which gives you a lot of power if you just understand these basic concepts and how to apply them within code. So I really wish that the, the chapter started with this kind of thing saying like, hey, here are the components that you need to know. Here are how the components are represented within ggplot2 code. So, um, but I want to highlight that. I thought this was a really good representation of it. And I was like, I don't know if the previous edition had this. And I thought this was a good kind of discussion about like, hey, here are the components, here are they're applied in code. So the first thing that we have to talk about is aesthetic mappings. And the book starts off by saying, okay, first we have to have some data, right? That's, that's pretty common. So it starts with a, a, an example data set that's available within ggplot2. Um, it is the MPG data. Uh, in this data set, it's a representation of 200 and, or has 234 observations of US Environmental Protection Agency efficiency measurements for cars. Um, how that's measured is we have such things as like highway mileage that's represented. And that's basically how many miles per gallon do you get when a car is driving on the highway, right? Uh, in addition to it, it has representations or variables like displacement, which displacement, if you're not a car person, is basically the engine size. If you want to be very specific about it, I think it's the actual like cylinder size. So the larger the cylinder, obviously the more gas it's going to use or the more cylinders it has, it's going to use more gas. So, but in general terms, it's just the size of the engine, right? And in addition to it, we have this um, discrete variable, categorical variable, which is class. Um, basically, it's the type of car. Is it a, um, is it an SUV? Is it a sedan? So on and so forth. So we're going to use this data set um, throughout to kind of emphasize some of these concepts that are discussed in here. So the first thing that gets talked about is mapping categorical variables in aesthetics. And so the book really starts off by just plotting out a scatter plot using displacement highway mileage, but then using an aesthetic mapping called color using the class variable to represent the different classes. Now, what is shared here is this example is we're getting two scatter plots, but you can see here in this aesthetic mapping, we have three aesthetics that we're mapping. We're mapping our X, our Y, and then our color. In this other example, we still have three aesthetics. We're using the same variables, but we're using the X aesthetic, the Y aesthetic, and the shape aesthetic. Now, there's some wonkiness that happens in here that the book talks about when it comes to like the amount of, of a class, how many classes it can have. But basically what you're seeing here is you're seeing two scatter plots same data just represented in different ways because we manipulated the aesthetic mapping elements that we're using. So here you can see basically we have a scatter plot, highway on the Y, displacement on the X, and then class is that categorical variable which we map to the color aesthetic. And as we would expect, each class gets its own color. Because we use shape in the second one, now each class is getting represented with its own shape. The one thing that the, the book talks about is, is that some aesthetics have certain limitations on what get applied. So in cases of applying a discrete variable to the shape aesthetic or a categorical variable to the shape aesthetic, you can see that it has this limitation by saying, hey, the maximum that is allowed by ggplot is six. So just so you know, we're only going to plot six and we're going to remove 62 rows of your last category, which was SUV. So it's really important. I think kind of the, the lesson that's being expressed here in the part of the book is be aware of what your aesthetic mappings can do because that's going to depend on the type of data that you have. Because not every single aesthetic mapping that you have 
is going to be appropriate for the data that you have. And it, the book talks about more examples about this, especially like applying like a discrete variable to a continuous type of aesthetic, so on and so forth. But this is kind of your first exposure to like, yeah, you have this flexibility to change your aesthetics, but just know that there are certain limitations. Um, the other thing to highlight is this is a warning. So ggplot2 is pretty eager. It's going to usually create a plot for you. So it's really important to be aware of the warnings. Again, as we've talked about before, warnings in R code are things to double check. Errors are things that are explicitly wrong and you need to fix. So like I said, ggplot2, it's eager. It's going to output a plot. So just be aware of the warnings that you have because that might be an indication of things that you need to fix. In this case, we're limited by not showing all the SUV, um, all the data points for the SUV category. So before I move on to um, some additional comments, does anybody have any questions or any anything else that they want to add to this conversation here? All right, great. Okay, um, moving on from here, there was a discussion about um, some additional conversation about mapping some more aesthetics using the different types of variables that we have um, and some of the limitations that we mentioned before. So I'm not gonna read these from the previous notes, but to kind of show you the examples here. Here, what we're doing is now we're taking that categorical variable class and we're applying it to two other aesthetics that may not necessarily be the best for the type of data that we have. In our case right here, we have size for class, which is just going to affect the size of the actual point itself. So it's going to change based on that. And I'm making it seem like it's continuous, but it's not technically. So it really doesn't work in this case. So this doesn't, you probably wouldn't do this in practice, but ggplot2, it's eager, it's going to output the plot. So it's important to know that ggplot will do this, but it's going to give you a warning to say, hey, Discrete variable for the size aesthetic is probably not advised. You probably want to fix this. In addition to this, we can apply this to alpha as well. Alpha is just the transparency of the specific point. So how much light actually gets passed through it. Um, usually with alpha, or alpha is not a great use, or it's not an aesthetic that's great for categorical variables as well. It will do it, but again, it's one of those things where it's better for like, uh, discrete variable or actually setting the aesthetic yourself or manually setting the alpha yourself. But again, it will do it. The main takeaway from here is know what type of data you have and know what aesthetics are appropriate for that specific data that you have. Okay. Let's see, moving on. Um, and when it comes to, when it comes to ggplot2, it's going to do a lot of the work for you. So once you have your data and you map your aesthetics, you just basically give it the genome that you want and ggplot2 is going to create the scale for you and create the representation and create all the legends if it's if the legends are needed for the aesthetic you set you don't have to do that ggplot will do the work for you um and it also does representation <laughs> representations for um like what's within the legend and then the tick marks itself but just so you know there is and we don't really talk too much about it here but the theme part of ggplot2 code allows you to change the actual like minute details of the actual plot itself. So if you wanna get rid of the minor tick marks or the minor lines, you can change it. Um, but ggplot takes a lot of the work away from you. You just basically say, here's my data, here's my aesthetics, here's the genome that I want. Um, in the design of ggplot2 code, I think the intention was, or the design of ggplot2 was for you to quickly iterate on the data or quickly iterate plots based on the data that you have. And so that was kind of the main, was that's one of the intents of ggplot2 code is to basically have you, give you the ability to quickly iterate on different types of plots if you just have data, if you know what data you have and what um, columns you want to represent. Okay. So, Aside from being able to assign data to aesthetics within our aesthetic call, we can manually set specific properties that we want. And so the case, the example that gets shared here 
is say we just want all of our points to be blue. That's all we want. Well, here we have our aesthetic mapping. We have our X and our Y uh, in our geom point, the geom point, obviously making points. We're just going to set it as blue, right? And so doing this, we manually set to change every single point to blue. This goes back to our previous example. If we wanted to have a specific color for each class of vehicle, we would take color and put it into our, our aesthetic call because then it would be using the data to do this. But instead, here we're actually using our manual set of what we want. Um, it's nice too. You can be very hyper customized with this. You can use like stock colors, like RGB colors, but you can go as far as using like hex codes. So if you're familiar with hex codes, you can actually get a very specific representation of a color that you want here. So if you have a very specific color, you can plug it in there. ggplot is smart enough to actually do that. So, so that's manual setting. Um, so the other thing is, is usually when we're doing a manual set of a specific aesthetic, we have to use some um, specific property value. So in case of color, we have to use a color value, whether that be represented in using natural language like blue or a hex code. If we're talking about the size of a point, so say we wanted to represent the size at a specific size for it, we would use like an integer, like one, two, three, whatever. Um, shapes are a little bit different. So if we wanted to change all the points to a specific shape, we have to use some of these preset specifications for us. Um, I'm not going to cover every single one of these because I don't think it's worth our time, but just know that there's 20 different preset shapes that you can include in your ggplot too. So you can set these manual. So if you would like a circle with a red fill, you just put 21, okay? If you want to know more about these, I highly, highly suggest to read the aesthetic specification vignette. Um, I don't know if we've talked a lot about vignettes in our discussions here, but really um, pretty much any package that the Tidyverse has, they're going to have what are called vignettes, which are just documentation. And I will say some of the, some of the greatest growth that I've had and learning how to do this has been reading the vignettes is actually reading the vignettes from the packages and these come with the packages themselves and i do have to share how to actually get here you can use a function called vignettes to get it but i'm going to bring my our my our studio over here so you can see it you can access most of this stuff in the help tab and basically when you go to the help tab what you can do is you, you can navigate to um, you can navigate to the specific package that you want to use um, so you can go to packages you can go to ggplot2 click ggplot2 and then there's usually like the user guides package vignettes and other documentation you click on that it will give you a listing of all the different vignettes now um, these are built in right these are built into the packages so Aesthetic specifications, you can read it here, get some information. Um, but most of the Tidyverse, they make this stuff available online as well. So this is the same documentation just in a web browser. Read it. Uh, that's the best thing I can say about it is to learn how these aesthetic specifications work and what are the different options that you have available to you. Just read the stock, you know, and, and you'll get a good sense of how to actually make minor modifications to different aesthetic things. So, um, so yeah, um, that's manually setting different aesthetic properties. Does anybody have any questions or anything that they want to add to the manual manipulation of ggplot2 elements? Am I still on point? <laughs> Am I getting it? <laughs> okay. Yeah, like I said, have a little bit of grace with me because um, because of this this uh, uh, this transition in the schedule. So, if I do miss anything, please please let me know. Um, there's some discussion about exercises. I'm not going to spend time talk about them one because I didn't have time to really dig into these. Um, but you can again, these are great representations to apply what you're learning, and I highly suggest looking at these because they really do challenge you um, to look at them. So let's talk about ge uh, geometric objects. So we have our aesthetic mappings. What we actually want to map. 
geome are the geometries, the shape that we want our data to take, okay? And geomes are really powerful because we can use the same data to represent what we want, but we can use geomes to manipulate how we want it to look. And I, I really think the power of ggplot, well, there's a lot of powerful tools, but I think a lot of the powerfulness of ggplot2 comes from the different geomes that you have available to you. So this shouldn't be a surprise here in our case, we're still going back to that displacement highway mileage. So size of the engine versus highway mileage. Obviously there's a negative relationship because the larger the engine gets, the more gas it's gonna take, the less efficient it's gonna be. But if we want, we can use geom point to represent it as a scatter plot. In addition to that, we can have the same data, displacement and highway, but represent this in a different type of shape using a function like geom smooth. Geom smooth, uh, goes out and actually creates some type of model and then actually plots that model for us with some type of confidence interval based on the model that it created. What's really cool about this is that it offloads that work for us. We don't have to actually do and calculate that specific model to get this representation of our data. We just do GM smooth. Um, if you want the flexibility to change what type of model is being specified here. So if you don't want to use a low S model, you want to use a linear model, you can change that. And you can actually have it do the actual calculation for you and do the representation in the plot. So one thing that ggplot do provides a convenience for us, and we'll talk about this in regards to like the statistics that it calculates for us is, is that based on the type of data that we have, ggplot2 in the background will actually calculate the things that we need to calculate or that we would consider calculating for the data that we have. So in this case, we're just actually creating a low S model representation of our data. And we get kind of like what the, the like the trend kind of looks like for these two, um, these two new marriage variables. Um, I don't use low S. I think I'm saying that correctly. I don't really use this model very often. I'm more of a linear model kind of person. Um, so if I did misrepresent this or said this wrong, you know, please let me know for sure. Um, so some more about some geometric objects. Um, big thing is, and it comes back to the big overarching, I think kind of one of the big overarching key points of this whole chapter is not every geome is going to work for the aesthetics you have, right? So just be cognizant of the data that you have. Um, so a good example of this would be, you can set the shape of a point, but you couldn't set the shape of a line. So a good example of it would be, like if you're trying to change the representation of what the line is, you're gonna use the aesthetic line type rather than shape. And so it's really important to match up your, um, to match up your aesthetic mappings with the appropriate geome. So um, here's the example that the book shares. So we're going back to using geome smooth. Here, what we can use is we can use shape, but you know because ggplot2 is eager, it's gonna try and create a plot for you. It's not gonna do anything. It's not gonna change the line. It's not gonna change the representation of the line. It is gonna create different groups based on the drivetrain of the actual vehicle drivetrain being whether it be a front wheel drive car, a four wheel drive car, or an all wheel drive car. But if we actually want to change the different line types, we have to use the proper aesthetic. And in our case here, because we're using Geome Smooth to create some type of representation of our data using some type of model or some type of line, we have to use line type and then give it the actual data set itself. And then it will change the specific line type based on the drivetrain of the car. So um, I think this one's pretty straightforward. It, the basic concept is just match up your aesthetic mapping with the genome that you're using. And if you don't, ggplot2 probably won't create what you expect it to actually do. OK. Um, I'm trying to, trying to, oh, so there was some discussion about like the actual legend itself. So some geomes, they will represent, or some geomes will automatically create some type of legend for you. So if you want to get rid of the legend, know that there are specific parameters in here to get rid of that legend. So in our case here, we're doing like a geom smooth, 
we're just changing color to drive. If we don't want to show the legend, we can just go show dot legend equals false, and then it will remove the legend from our plot. I feel like I might be missing something here because um, the notes weren't as clear. Um, so if I'm missing something in regards to this point here, someone please jump in. But I think the main takeaway here was like, if you don't want a legend, you can change that. So. Oh, and I guess there is some, you can also add additional aesthetics in your geometry. So like if you wanted a specific color for each drive chain of the car, you would just do that in your GM smooth do another aesthetic call and then do color drive. And now you have individual colors for each specific model line that gets created. What was the other point I think was trying to be made here. Okay, move on from this here. Um, we can, on top of this, specify different data layer, or we can specify additional layers. So. When I teach this, one thing that I basically say is, is you can have multiple geom calls. All you're really doing is you're just adding layers to your plot, right? It's just like you're adding a layer, add a layer, add a layer. Um, and that's basically what's happening here. You're going to have your um, global aesthetic mapping, right? So you're still going to be creating this scatter plot of displacement and highway. But what you can do is you can start layering on additional elements using additional geomes. So in this case here, say we want to specifically highlight two seater vehicles and we want to represent what their highway mileage is, the engine size. What we're going to do here is we're just going to take geome point and we're going to create the specific data that we want. And then we're going to do some manual representation of how we want to represent it. In our case here, we want them to be red. And then here, what we're doing is we want to take a different shape, circle open, change the size, make that size of that open circle a little bit larger, and then manually set them to be color red. And now you have those individual elements represented. Uh, I like this part right here because this is great um, for highlighting outliers. Um, so I teach, uh, I teach a class that's more focused on like sports data. And yeah, it's really interesting to see who the average people are or the average teams are, but where the real stories are or where the outliers are. And so we talk a lot about how can you represent like the outliers in this data. And so how to do that is we have to layer on additional geomes to highlight the specific points that are of interest to us. Um, so beyond just actually doing the geome point, we have different geomes available to us. So say we actually want to look at the distribution of our data. We can use geom histogram, geom density, or geom box plot to give us the five number representation, right? Here, we're kind of seeing a bimodal distribution from our highway mileage. Um, but the actual geom is going to take the work away from us to actually calculate what we need to calculate to create these distributions. So in our case here, if we did geom histogram, we're basically setting bin with two saying, um, hopefully I'm saying this correctly, it's going to put two observations in each bin and then it's going to count. No, that's not right. It's going to be two, um, two points on our scale is going to be the bin and then it's going to count observations inside of each one. That count, we don't explicitly state. We don't actually calculate that. ggplot2, because we're using geom histogram, has a stat function in the background that actually calculates that number for us and just does the count for us. So we don't have to do it. Um, but we can change this bin width. So if you're working with a very large data set and you want to change, modify that bin width to be as wide a range or as small a range as you want, you can change that. Um, Geom density um, is another one. It just creates a smooth line of the distribution. Somebody Somebody tried to explain this to me one time, um, made me go back to my statistics 101 days, and maybe there's somebody who's way smarter than me that can explain it, but the calculation it's making is based on some type of kernel function to make the line smooth, and then it creates the representation, but I am way outside my depth. So if anybody wants to add in how it actually does the stat calculation to create the smooth line, 
please do. Do I have any statisticians that are sitting there in the background saying, Colin, you got that completely wrong? Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to stick with it. But if anybody's watching this in the future, please, 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 please don't. Uh, don't send me hate mail because somebody tried to explain it to me one time um, and I don't understand it. But going back to kind of more in my depth, you can also do genome box plot and you can get the get the five numeric summary, right? And so the book kind of says like box plots are great for not only getting kind of like your distribution of it and getting kind of like the median value, but also looking at outliers and so on and so forth. So pretty much the way it gets put it is like if you can – if you can think of a plot that you've seen, more likely than not, there is some geome out there to help you get close to what you're trying to do. And in fact, if somebody should remind me of this, they does anybody ever remember? There used to be this live stream called Slice. Or no, it wasn't Sliced. It was um oh, what was it? They were trying what they were trying to do is they would go out and they would find like visualizations and then they would have people like try and recreate the visualizations and it was like a live stream competition and they would like have people like be like here's this graphic we found out in the wild use the tools that you have to create it and it was really kind of interesting to watch that sometimes because it was really cool how close you could get to some of these graphics that people had out in the wild and ggplot2 could do it and it was amazing. Like it was just absolutely amazing. And it was just based on like the geome itself. And if I remember right, I'm sorry, I'm going kind of off-roading here with some of my comments, but um, I remember at Posit this year and I should find the presentation if they have them up yet. Somebody created, um, used ggplot2 and they had the Palmer Penguin data set. But what they did is they used individual geomes to create a picture of a penguin on ggplot so they actually like made this really good looking penguin in ggplot code using specific geomes it was it blew my mind i was like you could pretty much do any graphic with ggplot if you you know just apply it and have the skills to do it so okay enough off-roading um but those are just some examples that i thought just like geomes are really powerful um when it comes to ggplot too if you're interested in seeing what is possible, a great place to start is, that's aesthetics. Cheat sheets are a good one. Um, penguins, thanks Milo. Um, let's see, some great places to start would be the actual, um, oh, where are they? I had it up here, profile. Bear with me here real quick. Aesthetic specifications. Ah, it's linked in there. I'll find it here in a second. And I don't want to bore you to death clicking through my tabs. But there's a is it reference. Yeah, here it is. Okay. So in the reference guide of ggplot2, it has all of the base geomes that come with ggplot2, right? And so pretty much if you want to create any data representation, start here. And it's nice because they kind of give you some visual representation here to be like, oh, what am I looking to do? I want to create a line. Okay. A, B line, H line, B line, might be something I'll look into. In addition to that, there are ggplot2 extensions. So if you don't have, or ggplot doesn't have the functionality for the specific geomes you want, more than likely somebody's created an extension for it. There is a gallery online that you can go through and you can pretty much find any plot that you want to create almost. Some are very specific. So um, like this one right here, GG genes. If you're somebody who's working in like a space working on genetic research, hey, there's an extension to do stuff with that. Um, I've used some of these uh, just last week, was using GG bump. Um, so some of these extensions are great. I've used GG ridges before to do um, distributions for different categorical variables. That's a good one. Um, but the end of the end of it basically is oh I've used GG Core Plot too that's a good one, um, but yeah just kind of scan through it because there is like I said if you can think it more than likely somebody's done it so um, before I move on to facets does anybody have any other comments or 
want to give more praise beyond what I've given for geomes? All right, great. Okay, so let's talk about facets. Um, uh, kernel density estimate, yes. That is, so Milo put into the chat, that is how the geome density calculates the actual smooth line for the distribution. But like I said, I'm I'm way above, I'm out of depth when it talks about that. But if you wanna dig more into it, you're more than welcome to do that. So thanks Milo. Um, so let's talk about facets. Uh, I talked about how I, how geomes are really powerful. I also think facets are another powerful element of ggplot2 code. Um, so I'm not gonna read this stuff to you. I think y'all can read it on your own. Let's look at the examples. But basically, say we want to create small multiples of our data or small multiple plots for our data based on some specific variable within our data. And specifically, say we want to look at this relationship of displacement to highway mileage, but we want to split out the data based on the number of cylinders a car has, right? That makes sense. Like the more cylinder a car has, as in like a V4 versus a V6 or a V8, um, is probably going to have a different relationship with the size of the engine with highway mileage. And so to do that, we can use facet wrap, use the tilde to split it up by the number of the cylinders in the car. And so what it does is it creates small multiples of our data. So why is this important? And it may not be as represented in here, maybe there is some type of relationship that is within our data, but it's not the same across different categories of our data. And so a um, good example of this would be like, you're looking at V4, there's a clear negative relationship here. But with like a V6 engine, uh, maybe not so much of a relationship. And even if you get to like a V8, there could be maybe even a pot, you could make an argument that visually there could be some type of positive relationship here. So facet wraps just give us a different view of our data based on some category within our, or some category of our data or some levels within our data. This kind of goes back to that initial um, quote that was in the top of the book. And I think this one's a really good one from John Tukey. Um, really this idea of where is it the greatest value of a picture is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see facet wraps is a good representation of this because splitting our data by based on different categories may give us a different a different view of the relationships within our data and so it kind of goes back to that start with that kind of first um quote from john tukey in the book um, so say we want to do like cross sections or we want to get like slices of our data, we need to go from facet wrap to facet grid. So say we want to kind of segment our data out by drivetrain by cylinder, we can do that, right? And so what you're getting here is um, four wheel drive cars, front wheel drive cars, rear view, rear view drive cars, say that five times fast, um, based on the number of cylinders. And this doesn't really work in this case because there's not data for some of these points or for some of these um, different like cross sections. And so it's just talking about it of how to do it. But again, it's just giving you a different view of your data, it gives you the ability to look at the relationship based on um, different categories uh, that you have within your data. So, um, let's see, that's are good. Let's talk about statistical transformations. Um, I will tell you that in my experience, and anybody can add in if they would like to this, in my experience, outside of like the really simplified statistical transformations that ggplot does, this is probably the, the black box part of ggplot2 that I don't fully understand, and I try to understand it. Um, there's probably somebody out there that's more versed in this than me, but the concept is pretty simple. And I think the concept is really simple, but the application of it in different areas gets kind of black boxy to me, but the book really has this good example with bar plots, right? So in our case here, we we're going, we're going to switch data sets here. We're going to go to the diamonds data set. If you're not familiar with the diamonds data set, it's like a data set of, I think 50,000 diamonds 
and it has different measurements of a diamond, like the different size of it, the number of carats. It has like the cut, the quality, the color, all kinds of stuff about a diamond, right? And all the observations are individual diamonds and there's like 50,000 of them. And one of those variables is cut, right? Like how, I'm guessing how well it's cut. I I, I don't deal in diamonds. I'm not, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't have, <laughs> I don't work in the diamond or jewelry industry. Um, so I would assume that's the quality of the cut, I'm guessing. Um, but basically what we're doing here is we're just going to create a bar plot of these. But you can see we only have one aesthetic mapping, right? In our case, we're putting cut, this categorical variable on the X. But where does this Y come from, right? It creates this calculation for us. It says that there are over 20,000 diamonds that are of an ideal cut. So the book kind of talks about that on the back end of ggplot, what it will do for specific geomes is it will actually create some type of aggregated data set for us in the background to create the representation for us. So yeah, that's basically what's happening. It's taking our data set, it's summing them up based on the specific cut that we have, and then it's actually creating the Y variable for us. So we don't have to specify that within our aesthetic. Now, if you wanted to, um, well, here, let's talk about this first. So in the background, it has a specific stat function that it does this. And this is where it kind of gets black boxy to me a little bit. And that's just me and someone can, you know, further inform me if my understanding is not correct, is that there are a lot of different stat functions that are available to you on the back end of them. And they're documented with the specific geome. And you have the ability <clears throat> to change the specific stat function that you want. So say you didn't want to count it, you wanted to do a proportion, you could do that. And so what you would have to do is, is you would have to in your aesthetic say, what's your X variable? What's your Y variable? And then use this function called after stat and then actually pass in the function call. So in our case, if we want proportion here, so what's the number of, or what's the proportion of ideal diamonds in comparison to other uh, cut, cut quality of our diamonds? We can do that here. So we can see over 40% or nearly 40% of all diamonds in our data set are of ideal cut. The only thing that changed there was the stat function that we applied, right? But as a default, geome bar is just gonna go with stat count. You can look this stuff up in the actual geome documentation. So if you go question mark geome um, bar, there's a specific section in the documentation that will talk to you about like, what are the stat functions that are available to you? Um, oh yeah. And that's, that's basically that. And then also too, if you want to be very specific to the types of stat functions you want to apply, you can, I don't do this. And I wanted to ask the group if anybody's ever done this before, I see the utility in it. But what you can use is you can use the stat summary function, define your aesthetics, your X and your Y, but then you can use function min or fun.max, these parameters, fun, and then actually pass in these functions for you to actually create your stat or the stat calculation that you want or your statistic calculation. So here in our case here, we're still getting the X and Y. So depth and then cut. And then what we're doing is we're getting a maximum estimate or a maximum calculation for this specific category, a minimum calculation, and then a median calculation. Um, I personally haven't done this in my own work, but has anybody done something like this before? Um, no. I think... The one thing I keep going back to with this is like, usually what I will do is I'll do the calculation outside of ggplot2 and then use that data set within ggplot code that I have. I think I would probably, it would be better served to actually lean on some of the ggplot2 code to actually do it. But again, for me, it kind of gets 
black boxy on what's actually happening on the back end of it sometimes. And I sit there and I say, what staff functions being used? What's being calculated? Um, what does the data actually look like? And is it being represented correctly? But like I said, there's probably some more sophisticated users of ggplot2 that would have a, a, a completely opposite argument of me. And yeah, um, different ways to do different things for different people. So, um, okay. So let's talk about position adjustments. So, um, so the book kind of talks about that we have different options to change not only the aesthetics, but how we represent things based on the position of our genomes. So here in our case here, the first example is sometimes the aesthetic mappings that we have may not necessarily make intuitive sense. And many of you have probably come across this, this situation before. Um, so we have a genome bar here. We're still looking at the same data set out of a diamond, making the calculation of how many diamonds are in there. But say we have this aesthetic mapping and you want to say, okay, I want each bar to be its own individual color. You would think that the aesthetic mapping would be color, but with genome bar, that's not the case. The color aesthetic is the outside outline of the bar. So instead, what you have to use is you have to use fill. And so fill is the actual color inside of it. And so it's just really important to kind of understand like, okay, there might be some different aesthetic mappings in this. But what's nice about it is we can use this fill element to apply other variables. So say we wanna put a third type of variable to create some type of stack bar plot. So say we're representing X on the, the X still is gonna be cut but say we want the clarity of the diamond. So what we can do is, is we can create a stacked bar representation of this data using this third variable. We have our calculated statistic, we have our um, X variable, which is cut, but now we have a representation of the clarity of data in each one of these. Um, this works, but say this isn't the best what we wanna do. Say rather than this, we would like to have each individual clarity have its own each individual bar. Or if we're using some, some type of scatter plot, maybe we want to create a little bit of jitter if there's too much overlap. So how to do that is we use position arguments to change this. So in our case, the default is going to be identi identity. It's just going to represent the data as it's represented. But say we wanted individual bars. We would use things like dodge or fill to change those positioning of it. So here's the example of this. So, um, and I think I may have said, no, this is identity. So this is, I didn't really understand this example in the book as much as I wanted to. Um, and somebody could probably further clarify this for me, but I didn't really understand why it shared this. I think the whole point of it was to discuss about like overlap but I don't know if this example did a good job of discussing. I don't know. Does anybody want to add or help me further kind of understand why this example was shared in the book? Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to say this one was kind of confusing for me. But um, if you wanted to, and I guess it's not in here. I wish the notes would have had this. But say we wanted to have individual bars for each different cut and clarity, we would use like dodge. Dodge would allow us to change the positioning of the, of the plot. So rather than stacking, it would be side by side. So maybe if we have time afterwards, cause I'm already at the 51 mark, I can show that. Um, but we just change that using this position argument. Um, the other thing that might be an issue is over plotting. Like if we have too much data, you might want to, um, to get a better like view, I don't wanna say better view, that's not the right way. If you wanna get, uh, uh, what's the right wording for this? If you want to kind of get a different view of your data or the data that's available, you can add a little bit of noise in the points using a position argument. So technically in our MPG data displacement and highway, there's a lot of data overlap. And so what we can use is we can use this position jitter argument to kind of just add a little bit of like noise to split these data points apart. And so I don't know if there's had the example, but we can look at it later. 
so what you're getting here is, is you're getting a better representation of the relationship between the data points, sacrificing some of the accuracy if you zoomed in on the data points. So technically this isn't a true representation of the data, but it does give you a clear representation of the relationship. Um, again, depending on the specific context you work in and what you're trying to communicate, choose which type of positioning you want. In this case, jitter works because we care about the, the relationship of highway mileage and displacement, not necessarily the, the specific positioning of the points. Okay. That's uh, extremely Good. useful when many values repeat. So we, you will put it in a scatter plot. And if you have, I don't know, 50 values, with, I don't know, 10, all the points will be overlapping. So adding, adding the, the jitter argument will allow you to visualize more or less how many points are really there and they are not overlapping completely. So when we are working with data sets, when values repeat a lot, the jitter, it's, I would say, extremely necessary to really have a, a good visualization. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, I think it, you know, and I'm not a, I'm not a science communicator, um, but it comes down to what are you trying to communicate? And if we have a lot of overlapping points, we have to address that. So if we care about representing the relationship of this data, yeah, absolutely. Jitter, yeah, at the sacrifice of total accuracy or complete accuracy, we can get a better representation or a different representation of the relationship because that's what we care about communicating. So um, that's what I go back to, but excellent, excellent point. Um, another example of this, rather than using positioning, is um, going back to alpha. So if you wanted to, what you could do is if you have a lot of different, a lot of overlapping points, you could add like comma alpha point, point four. And then that's going to allow you to kind of see the shading and depending on your data. I mean, if you're dealing with like a ton of points, it might not work, but a good example of this be would be um, we teach some of our, some the, in the class that I teach, we teach them how to create bubble charts and bubble charts just mainly being the third variable is just increasing the size of the bubble. But what happens is if you don't change the transparency of it, some of the bubbles overlap too much and they just create blobs. And so you could change the alpha to kind of see how much actual overlap there is. So there's different strategies to address this beyond just changing the position value. But yeah, excellent, excellent points. Um, let's see, I got five minutes. Am I going to be able to do this? Got coordinate systems. Oh, yeah, we can get this because the next point is just resources. So um, what we've been talking a lot about is just 2D representation. So very a very uh, Cartesian coordinate system. Um, that's the default in X and Y. But just know that there are different types of coordinate systems that you can use. Um, if you have mapping, if you're doing spatial data, there is mapping coordinates that you can change. If you would rather change it from being um, a 2D representation to a more kind of 360 view, you would use chord polar. If you want to transform the scaling of your X and Y representation, you can do that too. If you want to flip some of your representations, you can with chord flip, all kinds of stuff that you can use. Um, I'm not going to cover each one of these. The book talks about specific examples. I did want to say like, if you ever want to have a really good conversation, go talk to your spatial data analysts because they will spend a lot of time talking about like projections and how map projections actually work. Um, it is a very, very deep field of study. And I never understood how much nuance there is to the different projections of mapping. And so coordinates are really important when it comes to um, specific uh, specific areas of study. Um, but yeah, ggplot has different representations. So you can change those things. Um, Here's a good example of going back to the diamonds data set when we were looking at cut and clarity. We can just call chord flip or chord polar and it changes the representation of our actual coordinate system that we're using. In our case with flip, it's just changing the X and Y. So the Y is now the X, the X is now the Y. 
or we can change it into a 360 view with cord puller. So um, the book finishes up with some resources in the three minutes that I have left. Um, some of them get talked about. Cheat sheets are great. Um, DJ shared some of these last last week. Cheat sheets are great. Go look at them. ggplot2 has a specific um, cheat sheet available for you right here. Check it out. Um, read the docs. Look at the extensions. I don't really use this one very often, but there's a ggplot2 gallery that you can look at. Um, there is a cookbook for R. And specifically, there's a graph section. I've used this in the past. I haven't used it as of recent, but this is a great one as well. Um, but these resources are linked um, in uh, in the book itself. So that's layers in less than an hour. Um, anything else that anybody wants to add or any other questions, comments, or anything that they want to dive deeper into? I do want to say that this this chapter it goes a lot further. Um, there's an entire ggplot2 book, so one hour in one chapter is not enough to cover all the different aspects of ggplot2. And if you're interested in that, there are book clubs that will talk uh, that go through the ggplot2 book and dive into each of these topics in depth. And so I'm currently a part of that book club, and it's it. There are more, there's more things that you can learn from ggplot2 beyond just this chapter. So. Even a book is not enough for ggplot2. For <laughs> it, it, it comes back to, I mean, it says it point blankly here in the chapter. It's like, if you know these, if you have these skill sets, like if you understand like the basic, like going back to this basic structure, the layered grammar graphics, you can create hundreds of thousands of plots, which is insane to me. It's like so much power, um, which also says, you know, so much power also comes with a lot of responsibility. So it um, goes hand in hand, I guess. Um, but yeah, just knowing these this basic structure and knowing the grammar of graphics, you could do a lot of things with ggplot too. So let's see. I don't think I missed any questions in here. Amber had to jump off. So excellent. All right, cool. Any other thoughts? Any other closing things? Anything anybody wants to look at in more depth? All right, cool. Well, I really appreciate people joining in. I can hang out here for a couple more minutes um, if anybody wants to talk about more, but uh, have a good week off from r for ds I hope to see everybody back the following week. So um, everybody, we'll see everybody in two weeks. All right, cool. All right, see ya. Thank you. Thank you.